Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joshua Dick. I am the National Apartment Association's East Region Liaison, and I want to welcome you to today's NAA's Independent Rental Owners Webinar on bedbugs. We have over 275 individuals who have signed up for this webinar, so that's a great number, and we definitely appreciate you taking the time to participate. Today's webinar agenda will include comments from our sponsor, an NAA membership update, two speakers who will address the issue of bed bugs, and then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. I'd like to thank today's sponsor of the webinar, Zillow Group Rentals, and Jen Chan, who's the marketing specialist with the Zillow Group Rentals, is here to tell you more. Um, thanks, Joshua. So my name is Jennifer, and I'm, on, I'm a marketing specialist here on the marketing team at Zillow. Um, and I just wanted to share a few of the features of Zillow Group Rentals. So Zillow Group Rentals encompasses our consumer-facing brands of Zillow, Trulia, and Hotpads. So you're, if, if you advertise on Zillow, your listings will be seen on our partner sites, such as My New Place. Um, so some of the features of advertising your listings on Zillow is that we have the highest brand awareness of rental sites. So this means that in a blind study of rental shoppers that we did, we asked them to list the rental sites they use, and more times than any other brand, they listed Zillow as the site they use. Um, we also search, are searched more often um, than the term real estate on Google. So this is huge and shows how rapidly we're growing in brand recognition among consumers. Um, so there's, that's a lot of rental shoppers coming to our sites. So if you want your listing to be seen, this is a great place to advertise. Um, we know rental shoppers are shopping on our mobile sites, and we have 72% market share of all mobile users to the real estate category. Um, can you go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, so how do you get your listing onto Zillow Group Rentals? So if you're a landlord or a property manager of properties with fewer than 50 units, you can use Zillow Group Zillow Rental Manager to list on Zillow Trulia Hotpads and our other partner sites. Um, the best part is that it's free. So if you're, you were a Postlets user, we've rebranded. Postlets now has a new skin and you can access that from the Zillow site. Um, go to Zillow.com slash rental manager there on the bottom um, and you can log in with your Zillow login. Um, and instead of having to go to a different site to list a rental, you can do it all from Zillow. Um, and that enables you to look up comparables, post your listing, and share it. So I encourage you to download the app on your iOS or Android or update your Postlets app to access all the same features that you can from the desktop on your phone. So if you haven't tried the lead box, um, lead inbox feature, I encourage you to check that out. And it's a great way to compare the leads you're getting from Zillow, Trulia, and Hotpads. So thanks. And I'll turn it back over to you, Josh. Thank you, Jen. And thank you, Dan, for your sponsorship of the IRO Committee, not only this year in 2016, but also last year in 2015. We appreciate yeah. your support and commitment to NAA's independent rental owners. Yeah, we're happy to. Thank you. Absolutely. Before we get to our two speakers, I'd like to briefly highlight NAA. For those who may not know, for over 75 years, NAA has been the national voice of the apartment industry. We are a group of nearly 170 affiliated apartment associations nationwide, representing 8.1 million apartment homes with a strong focus on legislative, legal, education, and operating issues affecting apartment residents, managers, and owners at the local, state, and national level. NAA has grown over 10,000 members and almost 2 million apartment homes over the past four years. And this is a testament to what the NAA network, our local, state, and national associations has been able to provide. As a member, every NAA program has the potential to increase your bottom line. The NAA Government Affairs Department protects the industry through local, state, and national advocacy initiatives and grassroots mobilization. NAA Click and Lease is an online leasing program that maximizes profit and mitigates risk. NAA's Education Institute maximizes NOI through skill development training and an array of digital and print publications keep members up to date on the latest industry developments. Annual meetings and expositions provide professional, educational, and business opportunities. The NAA Open Door Program is an exclusive member benefit that offers valuable products and services at a price savings. Our members will tell you that the cost of membership dues 
are no comparison to the return on investment they receive from NAA. It's really invaluable to any business. If you are not a member of NAA, we encourage you to join. And if you are a member of NAA, we need your help to have all of your properties become members of NAA and to help communicate the value of NAA membership. For more information or to join, visit NAAHQ.org. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on NAA's website in the near future. To access the recording, again, go to NAAHQ.org backslash AEX. You see the website on the screen right now. And from there, you'll want to select the independent rental owner category. If you have a question during the webinar, please type it online at the right of your screen in the space where it asks for questions, and we will read them aloud during the webinar. At this point in time, I'd like to introduce both of our speakers. We have Charles Tassel and Corky Wolf. Charles is the Director of Government Affairs for the Greater Cincinnati Northern Kentucky Apartment Association. He consults for national, regional, and local organizations and developers. He has been working on public policies for the past 20 years and has advised policy development for dozens of states, counties, and municipalities, including authoring several pieces of legislation. He also serves on several state and regional boards. Corky was born and raised in the Houston area. He joined the United States Air Force right after high school, after which he was in criminal justice for five years. He became involved in multifamily work with Chicora Development in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. His family then moved to Tacoma, Washington, where he worked for the Pierce County Housing Authority. After moving back to Texas in 1998, he joined the Highland Commercial Properties family and was appointed as its general manager in 2008. Again, thank you both for agreeing to discuss this important topic today. Charles, I'll now turn it over to you. Thank you, Josh. I also mentioned I'm a I am a member of NAA through being an apartment owner myself and a licensed pest control operator as well. So touch on that. We'll jump right in with this, folks. Um, bed bugs. Everybody sees them. We've got them. Um, how do we address them? We're going to move through a couple of things. And as Josh mentioned, since this is recorded, uh, Corky and I both have a, a lot of information in the, in the PowerPoint here that people will be able to see afterwards. Um, so don't worry about taking the notes nearly as much as making sure you have questions. We want to be able to answer those questions if at all possible. So we'll move quickly through the material and be ready for Q&A. Let's go ahead and go to the slides here. Um, short version of this, they've been around with us forever. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. One of the main things we want to talk about is bed bugs popped up and, and have been around up through about the 1940s, but chemistry-wise, we were able to knock them back and really didn't see them in the developed world, that is Europe, um, America, especially until about the 2000s, they started to make a comeback. And one of the things that's a myth out there is that DDT, if we just brought that back, would solve the problem. It wouldn't. They've actually been working very hard at evolving, and parts of the rest of the world has actually been using DDT, so it doesn't work anymore. They've developed an immunity to it, or what's more actually termed a resistance to it. Next. Um, the bed bug itself, we will go into some actual pictures of them shortly, but I want to show you the, the smallest view, that little egg down there, you'll see is actually looks like about the size of a grain of salt. They're white, and you'll see them. Each one of those... Um, life cycles needs to actually feed on human blood before it can grow to its next size. Um, those smaller ones, anything less than an adult, actually needs to feed usually within about three days of reaching that size. Um, they do not last long. However, the adults can last up to a year, year and a half without feeding. They'll actually go into a hibernative state. So that's a, that's a big issue. One of the things you'll find this also for seniors, which is a real issue, is they like it warmer. Well, when a bed bug is actually in a warmer environment, they will actually go through this life cycle process at an accelerated rate. So instead of having a uh, 14 to 30 day window of life cycle growth, they can actually accelerate up to 7 to 10 days if they have food and warm temperatures. So that is, just know that if you're seeing something expand or an infestation expand very rapidly, it may be because it's a warmer temperature and it's set up for that. Um, I mentioned there that the, back up one real quick, the, there's a study that shows that these pests, uh, these pests are genetically designed to overcome pesticides. That is a big thing to understand because if you just rely on pesticides, you will eventually lose because your, your bugs will become immune to them. 
one of the things that you'll notice is that females leave the nest. Usually when you see one bed bug off by itself, it's an impregnated female, which means she's already got food and she's got eggs and she's going to lay eggs someplace else. So you've got to find the nest that she came from. Go ahead. Um, just warning for you, pre-prepared, this is what we're here to deal with. Go ahead, please. Um, you'll notice the adults, a lot of people, especially uh, managers, will get a call and they say, hey, I think I've got a bed bug. It may be, we've seen apple seeds, we've seen stink bugs, we've seen everything. The main thing we tell people is make sure that you're, you're, you're in, encouraging people to contact you. You want to find out about these calls earlier rather than later. Um, you'll notice the little female and male symbols by this. The males seem to have a, a more of a pointy backside. The females more of a rounded side. Um, I'm not going to go into any details on that, but one of the things you can tell is you can actually tell the difference in the um, whether they're male or female of the bugs, and that'll also give you an idea of what you're dealing with as far as how large an infestation it is. If the female is out by herself, you know you need to find the nest that she came from. Next, please. Um, this is what you're actually going to be seeing when they're out there. Uh, the red ones are actually, they've fed. The little black spots are their defecation. The little white spots there, you'll see both shells, which are when they've grown and they've shed their skins, to um, the little eggs that look like little tubes laying there. Now, this is a ex highly enlarged version of it, so if you see in the picture on the left, um, those little white spots, the eggs, are actually very small and hard to see. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. Um, one of the difficulties that we have is humans, we find bed bugs about 33% of the time. No matter how hard we look, we're just not that good at it. Some people say, well, should we use a dog or not? Typically, it's expensive to use one, but if you're not sure and you really need to prove it, dogs are usually 95% effective at actually finding bed bugs if there's a bed bug in the place. Um, one of the things we always talk about, and this is I talk about this as an owner and as a licensed pest control operator, make sure you have a partnership with your residents. Make sure they're telling you early if there's a problem so that they're not trying to handle it themselves and causing a bigger problem. Um, and then getting a quick professional response. We've gotten past a lot of the initial, oh my word, this is a big problem, what are we going to do? To, okay, let's address this issue and move forward. Here's how we're going to handle it. Um, and part of that means clear communication with the residents. Now, if you're partnering with your pest control operator and your maintenance guys know what to look for when they're going in, especially like the little black spots, you know, looking for the defecation or looking for those little, little bugs laying around, then you can start the notification process to let the resident know, bring the pest control operator in, and then working with the pest control operator on a plan. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. A couple of things you want to find out from that pest control operator first, are they licensed, are they experienced on bed bugs? And I don't just mean, hey, yeah, I've done some of this. What is their experience and what does their resume show? Um, there are a variety of different approaches from the pesticide of it to heat to trapping. Uh, there's actually a new uh, research out. I'll be working on an article on this talking about how trapping actually works both in identifying and resolving smaller infestations to cold. And what's really a best process is using some combination of these depending on your housing situation and depending on what else is going on in the building and the structure, how many people, how able they are to handle it. If you've got seniors, seniors are much less able to handle all the requirements that a pest control operator will ask of them. And I know Corky has a list of those coming up, so I'll, I will skip that part for now. Um, there are a couple of different levels of pest control operators. Some are will walk through your property. I'm sure you've seen this. They will just spray the baseboards. They spray stuff, and out they go. That's not going to be helpful. Neither is going to be helpful as if you have somebody who wants to crawl through every little detail, and they say, well, we're very diligent they may actually be running up a bill for you. Making sure that you're looking for where the pests are, which is typically where humans rest or sleep, so that means typically look for beds or couches, or if it's a bigger infestation, even into other areas such as couches, chairs, um, spreading out from there, usually within about six feet of those areas. Um, there's an interesting process, and there's two chemicals here, temperate and transport. What's interesting is an Ohio study shows that if these are used in a bed bug comes in contact with where that's been sprayed and stays there for about 45 minutes, which they usually stay for overnight or over day, I should say, um, it actually is lethal on them for up to six months. So those two pesticides, find a lot of pest control companies utilizing them, and it's very effective. Um, the dryer is one of your best friends, too, and this goes for your maintenance staff, um, leasing staff who might be going into a unit that's infested. If you have a dryer someplace on site that they can use, um, I when I go out, I come in, I change in my garage, and then stuff goes right in the dryer, including the shoes, but it only needs to go in for about 10 minutes or so. 
because dry, the heat actually kills the eggs as well as every level of the, the, the bug itself. 114 degrees takes about two to three minutes. 119 degrees takes less than a minute. Next, please. A couple of things to just be aware of. Do not use alcohol. People use alcohol and will spray it around. Alcohol can come in contact with a, a pilot stove, a pilot light on a stove or a, a, um, a water heater and will start a fire in a fast way. And it is very dangerous because it's a blue flame and it's hard to see. There have been a number of fires and deaths because of that issue. Um, pyrethroid base. Somebody will say, hey, I use a bed bug bomb. All that does is drive the bed bugs into the walls and into other units. It doesn't actually kill them. They just don't like it, so they go away. But they don't go out and just leave the building. They go into other units. Um, do not ignore the issue. Make sure you're showing diligence and showing documentation. The Iowa case was a $2.4 million class action settlement and ended up being including anybody who actually went to the property because they may have been contaminated by bed bugs there. Um, and this kind of comes where I talked about earlier with the professional response, not overreacting. Bed bugs are around. They've been around since humans have been around. So we just need to address them and, and respond to them appropriately. Um, some people immediately go through and throw out their furniture. That is not a good thing. You really want to slow down. Let's figure out what the infestation is, where it's at. Let the pest control operator get in there, see what's the problem, and see what needs to actually be addressed, whether it's something that does need to be discarded or something that needs to be sprayed and addressed or heated and addressed. Um, and this also comes back to the resident side or essentially your employee side, providing safe mechanisms for them. And sometimes that may mean, guess what, we have to look at their homes as well because if they're dealing with it on site, did they take something home with them as well? So something to consider for policy. Next, please. Um, document, document, document. This is this is the main thing, especially as it it will help you out if you have to deal with health departments. And health departments can only can not only be against you, but they can actually be for you. For example, if you have a situation where a resident is not doing what a licensed pest control operator instructed them to do, they are not preparing their that health department can also cite them as well. And that's a very helpful piece because if you need to go in for an eviction, you have a health department documentation saying they've already cert they've given some sort of um, citation to this individual or this resident, and then you can utilize it. Um, the other part is documenting at turnover. One of the things we're starting to do more is actually utilizing traps and such during turnover so we can find out if any, any bed bugs are coming out while nobody else is in there. Um, the last piece is really taking the, the proactive steps. Back when we talked about water, we always talked about making sure that people knew if they saw any water coming in, please let us know right away. And, and that's really the best thing is to make sure we're addressing that issue up front. Um, and just address that movement and say, look, it happens. We know it will happen at some point. We're down to one in seven people in the country will deal with bed bugs this year. If it happens to you, please let us know. We're ready to professionally respond to it. Next, please. Gorky, you're up. Hello, everybody. Um, a few, my name's Corky, and a few years ago I was watching the Discovery Channel, and, and I saw them talking about the heat process and the fact that bed bugs, you could kill them if you got them to reach 120 degrees. Um, next slide, please. And there, like I said, there are a lot, there are a lot of treatments, um, that, as Charles mentioned, but we prefer to use the treatment because we're, we don't really like uh, exposing our residents to chemicals and stuff. And it's, um, I must admit, using this heat, we have we have had issues, you know, where my guys didn't do it properly, and we we um, peeled up vinyl floors and stuff like that. It's been a learning process for us. So if you decide to do this, you, you need to be really be careful. Um, the uh, pest control companies will do heat treatments for you also, and there are now companies also that that are making self-contained heating units that you can put inside of your unit and kind of like a rotisserie oven. It's sort of a, a set it and forget it type method. Um, next slide. Um, to, describe our, to describe our heat process and to share our experiences so that you have a better understanding um, to help you decide and whether you want to do it for yourself or whether you should hire a pest control officer, you know, if that's what you decide to do. We, we've just found that the, the heat treatment for us has been pretty successful, and we've been doing it now for about four or five years. Um, the heat treatment is, is a, it's fast, it's environmentally friendly, and it's effective. 
um, if the process is, is done correctly and, and your residents are, are doing their share, um, we found that it's, it's been 95% effective for us. You know, we, once in a while we will have to go back because either either my staff pushed it and they didn't do it long enough or, or the residents weren't quite prepared for us. Um, next slide. The way we started ours is, is um, we take a take the front door, we open it up, and we, we cover the front door with a, a sheet of plywood with a hole in it, and we use uh, about four feet of eight-inch double wall flue pipe with a fan force propane heater that you can get at Home Depot for a couple of hundred dollars. And then depending on the size of the apartment, it, it takes two or three tanks of propane, and then we um, we use thermometers. We put thermometers up in every window visible from, from down on the ground. You know, the register, they're really large thermometers, so they're visible. And and then an extension cable to plug in all the equipment is what, what we use. And the units next door to the ones that were being treated, we, we install a, a temporary carbon monoxide uh, detector just, just in case. Uh, if the residents have any issues, they can come out and let us know. Um, next slide. The preparing the unit is, is, is got, I have to stress, is the most important thing. If, if, they're, if they're packed tightly, or they're not opened up, and the air can't circulate, it's, it's, it's not going to be effective. Um, so we usually we open up all the drawers. If their if their closets are packed tightly, we we will put up temporary clothes lines in their apartment so we can separate their clothes and hang them out. Um, any boxes that are packed tightly, it's we have to unpack and it just I call it toss the apartment, make it all loose. Um, they're going to spend the day cleaning it up when you're finished, but the the bed bug issue will pretty much be resolved. And any any clothes that 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 they can't you know keep in the apartment, we we own our own laundry, so we gave them laundry credit to go down there and run them through the dryers. Um, next slide. Um, the items that must be removed, it's uh, pets, of course, you know, the fish and aquariums and stuff. All your perishables, uh, perishables and stuff, I, I, I put them in the refrigerators, prescription medicines that, that can't be exposed to heat, we put those in the refrigerators. Um, makeup, wax-based items and candles and figurines and stuff like that. Any pressurized cans like, like aerosols, air fresheners and Lysol cans and, and anything like that, fire extinguishers, oxygen bottles, anything that could explode. Flammables, lighters, lamp fuel, solvents, and, and the same. Any, um, we found that wood, wood string anim, uh, instruments like guitars and everything, they, they can be affected by the heat, so we recommend any uh, musical instruments be removed and family heirlooms, anything that could not be replaced, just in case there is any issue being exposed to the heat. House plants you would need to set outside um, and, and like I said, some of the smaller items we just we toss them in the refrigerator and they're perfectly safe. Next slide. And and here again we we let them take their their sheeting and their clothing and everything down to the to the dryers and we just tell them put them in the dryers for 30 minutes and and everything should be taken care of. Next slide. And here again, this slide is just basically telling you any clothing and stuff that's left in place it needs to be you know removed so that it's not tightly tightly packed. And clothing on hangers can be left in the closet and the space between should be large enough for the air to flow. Um, other items, I guess we place them in, in, in baskets and leave them in, in, the, in the apartment so they can be circulated by air. Next slide. Um, the heat treatment requires moving a lot of air and so that the air can be moved all around the apartment. You don't want any cold spots or air pockets or anything like that. So, and a lot of times when we're when we're shoving the air into the front door, we will go to the back of the apartment and crack a window so that, that we do not get any any um, vacuum locked areas to where the air cannot be um, circulated around. We turn on the, the fan only on the, um, the central air system, so that's circulating the air. And then also we will put a couple carpet fans in the apartment to move the air around. And the um, knickknacks and everything, they, they may need to be secured if you're going to be blowing at them real hard. Pictures and stuff that are hanging on the walls, we, we tend to take those down and just lean them up against the walls and so they so they don't fall off. Um, next slide. Um, electronics, do we unplug the electronics and everything because they say bed books will tend to hide in there. And it's um, so we switch them all to the off up to position and we unplug them. We don't really worry about the electronics in the heat because we're only we're going only going up to about 130 degrees, 
And it's you know, shipping containers that stuff gets, comes to our country in in the summertime, it, it, they definitely reach more than 130 degrees. So we've never had any issues with, with people's TVs or, or any, anything like that um, unless, there, unless there was some disregard and it was in the wrong position. Uh, next slide. Um, water beds need to be drained. It's um, because we're trying to make the ambient temperature of everything in that apartment to reach 120 degrees for at least one hour. And so the water bed, it needs to be drained because it, it's the, the water, you'll never get it to heat up that high. And, and they should, air beds should be partially deflated to avoid those from expanding and then perhaps uh, rupturing. And comfort type air beds with electric pump must be partially deflated and unplugged also. Next slide. Um, we bag and remove the bedding, and like I say, we, we let them take it down to the laundry and wash it for free. Uh, we, we don't we don't charge our customers for the bed bug treatment. It's a kind of a courtesy thing we do to kind of keep it from spreading on us. Um, we lean all the mattresses and stuff up against the wall, and we, we loosen all the cushions on the furniture, like on the sofa, we take the cushions off of it. And because it, the idea is if when you're doing the treatment, you stick your hand down in the back of that sofa, it should reach 120 degrees and be there at least an hour. So we, we try to make it loose enough to where it, it reaches that easily. Next slide. Uh, same with the drawers. It's, um, it's, we loosen the unit up. It's just make sure nothing is, is packed too tightly. Um, we can do the next slide. And we turn on the ceiling fans and the air handle the furnace. Next slide. And now, we, we, like I said, we pack open some windows to, to allow the heat to move through the unit properly. We, we open the front door and leave it standing open, and the piece of plywood we use with the hole, we have it offset. Um, if I, we made a mistake one time, and my guy put the offset on the wrong side, and it bubbled the paint on the, on the door. So now we always check to make sure that it's, it's offset away from the door, so when we're forcing the hot air in there, it, it, it doesn't affect the paint on the door. Next slide. Um, here you can see the thermometers. We have we have a handheld infrared that we shoot into the unit also, and then we have the thermometers that we put in the windows, and we heat the unit to 120 to 130 degrees, and then adjust the heat to maintain the temperature. And I have a guy monitoring those that heater at all, all times. Um, we we maintain that that temperature for at least four hours, but we have found that sometimes if they only do it four hours, it's it doesn't quite cover the unit. So now I get it to 120. I tell them to say, we start the process at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I say, don't shut it down till 5. And since we've started doing that, we're at almost a 99% success rate. Um, everything in the unit must reach 120 degrees Fahrenheit for one hour for this process to be effective. So inside the mattress needs to be 120 degrees. You know, down in your cushions of your sofa and, and everything should be 120 degrees. Um, and like I said, we use an infrared thermometer to, to shoot into the windows and, and, and kind of check the temperatures throughout the apartment. And then, we, like I said, we monitor it, monitor it, monitor it. It's because um, you're shooting flame into that unit almost. It's that propane heater. It, it, it puts out hot, hot uh, heat source. Next slide. So here, here it's just showing my guy. He's screwing the panel to the door. And then they're, they're hooking up the 8-inch double flue pipe. And then it's, we all set the heater, and that way we're not shooting flame directly into the apartment. It's, by the time it comes through the flue pipe, it's just extremely hot air. Next slide. And it's, we like the end, we use the, the fan force heater. It's in, you can get those at your local Home Depot or Lowe's, and it's a couple hundred bucks. Next slide. And the process is to bring in the heat, move the air, and monitor it. It's basically that simple. Next slide. Okay, the larger units, as I was talking, we, we use fans in those. It's just like townhomes and stuff. We use fans to pump the air upstairs. Um, we, made, we open the window in the back of the unit to, to prevent pressurization to where you, you get vapor locks or cold spots into the apartments. And again, we put CO2 detectors in the, uh, the adjacent room, uh, unit and the res residents in the adjacent unit. We always let them know what's going on. Um, you can use bed bug dogs to make sure that bed bugs are not in an adjacent unit also if you want to. And here we need to stress if you have fire sprinkler systems, um, you might need to research those. If they're set off by heat, they're going to get set off. Um, so we have no experience with the fire, fire sprinkler systems because we don't, we don't have any in our units, but it's, um, we had heard it sometimes that, that they're set off by heat. Um, next slide, please. 
and that's pretty much it for our process. Um, following now is just a bunch of facts that you guys will, if they will be included into the, the PowerPoint for y'all. Um, you can read through those at your leisure whenever whenever this is available online. And that's it for me, guys. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you again, uh, both Charles and Corky. You did a fabulous job on an issue that's very important to many of us. What I'll do now is uh, go ahead and read the questions that have come in, and I encourage you to continue to type those in. Again, on the right of your screen, there's a place for questions. Just type them in. The ones that we have so far are, assuming we can prove that a resident brought in the infestation to our property, can we legally pursue recovery of costs? This is Charles. That's, that's an interesting question. It depends on which state you are in and also what your municipal rules are and laws are, as well as what your health department's disposition is. Um, we've had judges that have literally been scared to death to bring bed bugs home because they found them in their jury box and their wife threatened to put them out in the doghouse. Um, and those judges take a very harsh view of, you know, somebody bringing in bed bugs. However, um, the, the, the caution I would have for you on this is the practical side of the precedent that's set. If you charge somebody for the bed bugs, the next person isn't going to tell you about bed bugs. Neither is the next one. And what's going to happen is they will get a bad, bad bed bug case and then they will move out. And what happens then is now you're sitting on an empty unit that's infesting other units with bed bugs because they don't want to tell you because they don't want to pay. Figuring out some sort of a partnership approach has typically worked very well and if the resident isn't keeping up their end of the bargain then you can look at utilizing the health department to come in on your side and you've got documentation to show that you've been doing a diligent process. All right, the next one is would putting infested furniture in an incinerator be an option? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, putting, it out, say putting it out by the trash just means that somebody's going to dumpster dive and put it someplace else. And on that point, if I if I may, as I have instructed my on-site staff, whenever they see a mattress or a sofa or a chair or anything out by our dumpster, they're to take a utility knife and, and deem it inserviceable. They rip it all up. Correct. And that way it, does, it doesn't get hauled into another unit because we find that, that problem a lot. Units in Phoenix, Arizona, where temperatures during summer months can easily be over 100 degrees 24 hours a day, can we vacate the property, lock it up, and let the weather do the job? If, if the unit reaches 120 degrees for a, a period of time, yes, I, I would say it would. But it, it, it needs to reach 120 degrees for at least an hour. The ambient temperature. I mean, inside the walls needs to be 120 degrees. Inside the cabinets needs to be 120 degrees. Everything in there needs to reach 120 degrees for at least an hour. How long can a bed bug survive? Um, uh, the the young ones actually don't survive very long if they don't feed. The adults tests have shown so far that they can go up to a year and a half without eating and going into literally a hibernating sta status. Um, so it's not like we can leave a unit offline and outlast them. I am in California and neither the local health department and the city have any policies governing bed bugs. you have recourse for someone in that situation, Charles or Corky? Um, I'm going to say, make sure they put a policy together that's reasonable because they're still going to, if they're looking at possibly eviction, what are their attorneys who go to eviction court, what do those judges think? Um, I can tell you in our, we've had a magistrate throw somebody in, in jail because they brought bed bugs into the, into the, into the eviction court in a bottle and then broke, and the bottle happened to fall and break. So they held them in contempt and put them in jail. That's really where the rubber hits the road. So finding out what, what the eviction court says may be more important then. Will this treatment kill other pests if they are present? 
I'll have to defer that to Charles. I'm not sure. Um, the other, they said pests, right? Doesn't say pets. <laughs> you know, <laughs> make sure That's we're right. clear yeah. on that. Pests. Okay. Um, on a, any any pest control um, or pesticide that's utilized, it will have specific pests that are listed for. So there are also content, or there's also mixture levels for the pesticides based on different kinds of pests. So there may be overlap, but not necessarily. The pesticides that are used, for example, tempered and transport, are specifically targeted towards bed bugs. They may have um, application to other areas, but you want to talk to your pest control operator or what every pest control operator is told is make sure they read the label. And the pest control operator should be telling you what pesticide they are using and what their concentration is. What legal options do we have for tenants that don't comply with an exterminator instructions? That's one where you want to make sure that you document, document that you have done what you're supposed to do. The pest control operator has given them the regulations or the rules that they need to follow that they haven't complied. And ideally, if you can get pictures of it, for example, not picking up the clutter, not doing things, putting things in place, get pictures of that and moving for eviction. You can, again, go for second cause of action as well for additional costs, especially if it goes into additional units while you were trying to get them evicted because they didn't do what they're supposed to do. And talk to your attorney on that as well. What is the standard number of chemical treatments per unit bed bug infestation? We've had pest control vendors say two or three times within a 10 to 30 day span. And the reason they're saying that is the life cycle of the bed bug. Um, eggs typically hatch within seven to 10 days. And a lot of the pesticides do not necessarily penetrate the eggs. The egg has a waxy surface on it. So they don't actually penetrate. So what happens is the pesticide company needs to come out two to three times to break up that life cycle so that even if there are adults laying more eggs, as those eggs hatch, another layer of pesticide is applied, killing those, killing those new, new hatchlings and such to get rid of it. So two to three is pretty consistent. Does constant vacuuming help? Actually, it does help, but it will not solve the problem entirely. Um, one of the things I think, Corky, you had it in your listing of, you know, rules of things to do for the resident. Um, cleanliness, eliminating clutter, vacuuming, um, using the dryer regularly, using the washer and dryer, but the dryer especially on a regular basis helps eliminate all those nymphs and such before they ever reach the adult stage to lay more eggs. Is there any residual propane smell when heating the unit? What was the, what was the question again? Is there any residual propane smell when heating the unit? No, we, we've never had an issue with that. Do you recommend switching to a pest control company that has a canine to do bed bug inspection versus a company that does not have a canine? Um, I, I do not. Um, I look at the, the dog or the canine resource as if I've reached some sort of loggerheads with a resident that you know, we've gone through consistently, we haven't found anything, my pest control operators haven't found anything, at a point where, and again, this is a resident I don't want to lose, versus one I don't mind losing, um, you know, if we need to go through the process of bringing in a dog to clarify that, no, this unit is actually clean, or no, there really is something there, e either way, that may be the area where I'd bring in a canine resource. How long does it take for an infestation to occur? Uh, part of that depends on temperature. The, the warmer it is, the quicker it occurs. Um, that's why I mentioned about senior units that typically are, seniors will typically keep their units in 75, 80 degrees and such. The bed bug life cycle speeds up and literally you can have one, one female can lay five to 12 eggs per day. Just let that sink in, five to 12 eggs per day. And she can do that off of one feeding. So once she's fed, she goes out and lays those eggs. 
Once she feeds again, she'll keep doing it. What dog breeds are best at sniffing out the bed bugs? How can I train my dog to sniff them out? That's a good question. Um, <laughs> I believe there's a couple of facilities in Georgia that actually do the training on that, and I don't know anything about which breeds are best on that. Is diatomaceous earth effective as a treatment if puffed into the walls and on furniture? Um, diatomaceous earth actually affects the bed bugs because it's a crystal that's very sharp for them, and as they crawl over it or through it, it actually scratches their skin and makes them dry out and dehydrate and die. Um, so that is one of the few, uh, few um, pesticides or I shouldn't say pesticide, materials you can actually puff into places near electrical outlets and such rather than using a, because you wouldn't want to put something wet in there, of course. Um, so that is an effective use in that area. Um, however, what you'll find is people have done everything from eating diatomaceous earth, please don't, um, to literally covering their carpet in diatomaceous earth, which, again, isn't going to solve it either. Would you recommend quarterly canine inspections as a form of due diligence? Would the benefits warrant the expense? Um, the pricing that I've seen is roughly $100 per unit. Um, I've heard of bulk groups where they've gone through for $40, $50 a unit, um, but that was a quick walkthrough. I don't think that justifies it compared to using inexpensive traps, searching, hunting, um, keeping your eyes open for it. What insecticide can a resident use to treat bed bugs? This touches on an area where we have to be careful. Um, what a resident uses is one thing. What an apartment owner does is, a different, is different. And, and you want to be careful of that barrier between the owner and the resident. And here's why. Every state has different rules on their licensed pest control operation and who can actually apply pesticides and when. So knowing that we're in multiple states with this conversation, please look up and know what your pest control operations laws are. Um, residents, there's over-the-counter materials that they can purchase, but as a landlord typically or a property manager or owner, you do not want to be handing pest control materials to a resident. That is usually a, a prescription for a lawsuit. How fast can bed bugs spread from one unit to the next? Uh, one person walking in and walking to the next unit. They're, they are hitchhikers by nature. Um, they crawl relatively slowly in one sense, but they are persistent. Um, they will go through walls. They will go through sockets. If one unit is empty, eventually they start looking for CO2, um, which is what we breathe out, and that's what they go searching for. Can pets, like cats or dogs, bring in bed bugs? Actually, bed bugs don't really like hair. Um, so most cats and dogs, while they may hitchhike a little bit, ticks are a bigger issue with cats and dogs than bed bugs are. Bed bugs are more likely to be on a person, um, caught in cuffs, um, different parts of clothing, um, backpacks. Kids have a big issue with this at schools, backpacks that are next to each other, and then they take them home. Um, that's, that's probably a bigger issue than even animals. We had a tenant that had to stay in a nursing facility. Upon return, they reported bed bugs. The tenant maintains that the bugs are from the nursing facility. If this is the case, is the nursing facility liable? That's a good question I'll leave for an attorney. I'm not sure the state or which scenario that's in, but the, the difficulty we've had in proving liability is this. In order to say that this bed bug specifically came from this area, you literally have to go in and check the DNA of that bed bug and check it with the DNA of the other bed bugs in order to prove a liability. And then you still have to prove that there is a direct connection between that bed bug derived, derived from that place to this place. So that's, that's a pretty tall order on a legal level. 
Do bed bugs carry any diseases? To date, there is not a vector. They are not been shown as a vector for disease, which means bed bugs have not been classified as vermin. Um, there are a couple of studies going on right now relate to another disease that is more in South America, and there is testing being done. Typically, what occurs with bed bugs um, are two reactions. One is a, a, a itching, swelling, similar to a mosquito bite. The other one is an infest, infection in the skin where somebody is scratched excessively because of the bites themselves. And, and ironically, I'll mention 40% of people do not even show a response when they're bitten by a bed bug. I've heard that spraying tree tea oil and putting dryer sheets in drawers help repel bed bugs. Is that true? I'm not sure about dryer sheets. Um, tea tree oil actually has an effect on a lot of pests, including lice for that matter. Um, again, it doesn't necessarily kill them, but it's one thing that they don't like, so they will not go in that area or they try to avoid it. That doesn't mean you're going to kill them off, though. How long should a tenant stay out of their unit after heat treatment? We, they, we tell them they have, they have to stay gone all day, but once we're done with the heat treatment and we get it all cleaned up, they can go back in there immediately. I mean, it's going to be warm and it'll take a while for the central air to, to cool everything back down, but there's, there's no residual left in there after the heat. We don't have any other questions. Uh, Charles or Corky, is there anything else you want to say in conclusion? Uh, no, I don't have anything. No, that was, that was a good one. It's just know what your, what your pest control uh, requirements are because you don't want to cross a boundary or step over something with your health department or your pest control operations, you know, and, and take care of your, listen to what your employees are telling you. They'll typically know if they've got a resident who will tell them what's going on in the community. We had actually one more pop in a question. Since you said it is a challenge to prove where the bed bugs come from, what are the best policies and procedures a landlord can do at turnover and at moving in? This is where um, if you like to do the heating, heat it up while it's empty. You can document that you've done that. Put the pesticides down. Um, do a, a, a test kit. In other words, uh, a, a, a trap that's out there, make sure it's got some sort of active bait in it, whether it's CO2 or something. Like that. CO2 is one of the better solutions. But if you find, put a trap in there, what they'll do is they'll come to that because there's no other source for them to eat. And if you don't get anything over several days, it's a good way to say, hey, we tested, we sprayed, this unit was clear, and you've got documentation at turnover. Again, Charles and Corky, we appreciate your time today, as well as all of the participants on this webinar. As a reminder, this webinar was recorded and will be available in about a week. Again, to access the recording, visit naahq.org backslash AEX. And then from there, you want to select the independent rental owner category. Again, naahq.org backslash AEX. Again, thank you, everyone. And take care. This concludes today's webinar.